Oh. Good afternoon, friends. I'm Beth Hessel, the Executive Director of the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. You also see Tess Galen, our Events Coordinator, and Bruce Laverty, our Curator online for our Afternoons with the Athenaeum. We're so pleased you're here, whether you're a member or a friend or someone who's just learning about us having seen this event on Eventbrite. If you love history, you love Philadelphia, you love learning about our buildings and our architecture, um, about our built environment and the people who have lived here and shaped our city and our world, this is the place for you. We are excited to be here for the final of Bruce's installation of the long history of the Athenaeum. And I uh, hope you will enjoy it as well. I want to turn it over to Bruce. After he's done with his talk, I will be moderating any questions you might have, which I ask you and invite you to put in the Q&A section um, so I can easily find them. And um, looking forward to this conversation. Bruce. Thank you, Beth. And uh, let's get the screen going. Can you see it? No. Okay, let me try again then. <laughs> All right. It'll be the same as usual. There we go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, for uh, joining us today uh, for uh, 219 Reborn, 1968 to 1999. Uh, I feel a little, little bit ambivalent about this because it's hard to to think uh, of, of history uh, of so much time that uh, that you've spent uh, on your own. Everything else had, had been rather academic, uh, but um, this is certainly a pivotal time in in Athenaeum history. And uh, I hope you'll enjoy it. It's, it's by no, mean, by no means uh, comprehensive, uh, but uh, it'll give you an idea of uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, transformational changes that occurred uh, in this institution and this building um, um, since, uh, since that year of 1968. Let's start off uh, with something that I, I happened to find last month uh, in, uh, in the Athenaeum scrapbook. Uh, and it's uh, from the Sunday Bulletin uh, women's section uh, from September 19th of 1971. Uh, back then, nearly everyone did uh, read the bulletin and it was common for all uh, major papers to have uh, women's or ladies uh, sections. Uh, you might be interested to see that in the color spread on the cover of the women's section uh, that, uh, that Sunday uh, was our own Athenaeum reading room. Um, generally, this was a section of the paper that I skipped over uh, when, uh, when I was reading the, news, uh, the Sunday papers uh, in 1971. Uh, I had just started my freshman year at Central High School, uh, and so the latest in fall fashions was not something that was at the top of my, uh, the top of my list. Uh, but you'll notice uh, in, the, uh, in the upper right-hand corner the, the kinds of things that you might find in the women's section in 1971, fashion first, society, uh, and then family, uh, family living, uh, uh, probably in that order. And so there is this uh, uh, attractive uh, woman uh, modeling uh, the latest fall fashions uh, in our reading room. And uh, I just had to uh, reproduce the, uh, uh, the headline by Bulletin Fashion Editor uh, Phyllis Feldkamp. Can a girl who has been wearing gypsy skirts and fast, fanciful costumery of other ilks uh, get herself into a fresh frame of fashion reference. Can she be classic, tailored? Well, we are going to find out this fall for the classic Renaissance is here. Designers have rediscovered the lasting values of a number of items that had been languishing in comparative oblivion while exaggerated kook clothes took over the scene. Uh, and the caption uh, of, this, uh, of this cover image uh, said, return to classicism. Even casual cloche, chaste skirt, and sweater vest shown in the East Reading Room of Philadelphia's Athenaeum Library, built in 1847. Keep the new mood. Uh, and uh, in case you lost the connection between uh, uh, classical architecture and uh, the fashions of 1971, uh, they went further on to explain it. Like the current rebirth in fashion, neoclassical architecture was a reaffirmation of lasting values. 
It borrowed from past glories, but architects like today's clothing designers used old forms to express their own new ideas. Philadelphia being especially rich in great revival buildings and rooms of the 19th century, they seem to be ideal backgrounds for photographing the new classics fashions. Some local interiors we use, such as the Italianate East Reading Room of the Athenaeum of Philadelphia, shown on our cover, are rarely seen by the general public. Now for more on how a girl can get away from last year's costume party and into this fall's sane serenity, turn the page. Uh, and uh, the reason I started with this is that um, many times over the years, um, the Athenaeum has been used for uh, model shoots uh, and for uh, various uh, photography shoots, uh, primarily because uh, the reading room uh, has such uh, classical grandeur. Uh, but it also got me to thinking that uh, in the time period we're looking at, 1968 through the end of the century, um, part of the great, uh, the great question was uh, exactly what the Athenaeum would be. And, and would it be simply uh, a beautiful classical backdrop for the latest fashion, uh, or might it be, uh, might it be something more? Uh, as always, I uh, pay a tribute to uh, Roger Moss and to his uh, wonderful book, Philadelphia Victorian, which was written during this time period. Uh, uh, Roger spent um, uh, probably close to 20 years or more actually uh, compiling the book. Uh, and uh, while it is richly illustrated, and beautifully written, um, it is thoroughly uh, researched. Uh, and so he scoured for years the Athenaeum archives and cited uh, every, uh, uh, every, every fact that uh, was, was quoted in it. So I, I highly, recommend, uh, highly recommend the book. So uh, again, uh, the Athenaeum is a subscription library, a national historic landmark and an independent research library with internationally recognized historic collections documenting architecture, design, history, and the built environment. This is something that I've been mentioning in every one of my talks. Uh, and the reason that the two, uh, the two items uh, in the bullet points below are in yellow is that uh, these two things are actually occurred uh, during the time period we're gonna be examining now. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, it is, uh, it is a transformational uh, change to, uh, to the organization. Last, uh, uh, my last talk, um, I showed a picture of Floyd and somebody asked a question uh, at the end of the program, I think it was Adam, um, did Floyd have a last name and did, did I know it? And I am ashamed to admit that uh, I did not know it at, at the time, but uh, I did find, uh, find out about it. Um, Floyd uh, was our custodian who greeted uh, Mr. Dallet uh, on his arrival to, to the Athenaeum. Uh, and um, so uh, I went to uh, the primary source uh, for all things Athenaeum uh, um, in terms of personnel uh, in the last, uh, last 60 plus years. Uh, and that is Mrs. G, our former uh, uh, membership secretary uh, and uh, the senior staff person uh, of the Athenaeum. Uh, she began here in 1961. Uh, she was hired in preparation for the Athenaeum Ball. Uh, and um, uh, of course, Mrs. G knew. Uh, and so Floyd's last name was Lucas. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, what I did was I did some further checking into, into our files. And uh, Floyd was uh, born in North Carolina in 1905. Uh, he lived in West Philadelphia. Uh, and he worked for the Athenaeum. He came to the Athenaeum in 1952. Uh, and he retired from the Athenaeum in the year 19, uh, in the year 1970. Uh, and uh, both the folks that I've talked to, uh, talked to uh, and uh, the things that I have read about his career at the Athenaeum uh, all uh, have him uh, as an exemplary employee in terms of his care uh, for a, um, a problematic building at, at best. And Floyd actually worked under five different directors uh, in his 18 year career at, at the Athenaeum. Uh, and that gives you some indication of the, um, of the state of affairs uh, at the Athenaeum during that transitional time. Uh, he, worked, he was hired by Arthur Kennedy. Uh, uh, he worked for James Dallet, uh, Edward C. Carter, who was the director from 1962 to 64. 
Uh, Dr. Carter uh, would go on to become the director of the American Philosophical Society. Uh, Edwin Boone from 1964 to 1968, and then Roger uh, Moss uh, from 1968 to 2008, uh, a 40-year uh, time span. And so um, if I could go back a little bit, because history does not, uh, the themes of history do not always divide uh, quite, uh, quite uh, uh, evenly along, uh, along year lines. Uh, to some of what we had talked about uh, last time. Uh, and uh, we're looking at the Athenaeum in the 1950s uh, and uh, the external uh, threats ceased to the building. We, we had talked about a century of uh, people trying to either buy our building, tear it down uh, or, uh, uh, or have the organization merge with another one. Uh, the last of those efforts came from our neighbors uh, to the left in this picture, the Penn Mutual Company. Uh, who had purchased the two houses to the south of us, to the right of the Athenaeum building, uh, in the hopes of expanding southward. Uh, and they were rebuffed by the, uh, the Athenaeum uh, in, 19, uh, in 1951. Uh, and the Penn Mutual Company uh, uh, eventually sold those two houses to uh, Mayor Richardson Dilworth uh, and his wife, uh, who promptly tore them down and built the, uh, the house that is, there, uh, that is there now in 1956 and 1957. Uh, so by the early 1950s, the external threats to the Athenaeum were, uh, were gone, uh, but the internal threats uh, remained. Uh, and those uh, threats included uh, the dwindling me membership, a century of deferred maintenance on the building, and uh, what I'd like to talk about for a little bit was an ambivalence in the leadership of the Athenaeum about the, the value of, of, of the collections. Uh, and here, this is another great, uh, a great uh, photograph to, to use um, in a didactic way because it's the building uh, on the right of, the, uh, of those two houses in between the Athenaeum and the Livingcott building where, the, uh, where one of the, the, the problems came from. Uh, and that, that would have been from Mr. Joseph uh, Livingcott, who was on our board of directors and a member of the library committee. Uh, and in, uh, 19, uh, in 1954, uh, Mr. Livingcott, uh, uh, together with other members of the library committee, suggested that the Athenaeum dispose of uh, all of its older collections. Let's get rid of all of, the, uh, all of the older books, many volumes of which were not adequately cataloged. Uh, and um, this didn't sit well with Mr. Kennedy, who was the, uh, the director and the librarian at the time. Uh, it particularly didn't sit well after, uh, without his knowledge, uh, the library committee hired a part-time librarian from the free library to start sorting books on our shelves uh, for uh, disposition. Uh, and so uh, in a somewhat desperate attempt, uh, Arthur Kennedy reached out to, uh, to a friend of his uh, in Boston. And he reached out to Walter Murray White, uh, Muir, Muir uh, Whitehill, uh, who was the librarian at the Boston Athenaeum. Uh, he had also worked for the Massachusetts Historical Society, uh, as well as the, uh, the, the Peabody Museum in Salem, Massachusetts. So he, he had uh, already an established career uh, as, uh, as a bookman and uh, somebody familiar with historic institutions. Uh, and so what, uh, what Kennedy did was he invited um, uh, Whitehill to come to Philadelphia and spend a day just looking at the shelves uh, to make a recommendation as to whether this, uh, whether this collection, collection should be pitched uh, or not. Uh, and uh, Whitehill came through uh, and um, it's worth quoting him in full here. Uh, this is uh, Walter, uh, Walter Whitehill's words after he had spent a day here. He said, um, as, I, as I see it, the only hope, and I feel it's a very good hope, of an old institution is to build upon the things in its tradition, retaining as many of the pleasant things of the past that are possible, while introducing those improvements that do not alter the character of the institution. While I found the building completely delightful, I was considerably distressed to learn of the steps now underway to, disperse, to dispose of certain of the older books. Here in Boston, I particularly value the thousands of what might be called, quote, second-rate rare books in the eyes of the book trade. Nevertheless, often contain information of extraordinary value to the scholar and to acquire increased usefulness by their proximity to others of their kind. Uh, and so um, 
Whitehill sends this letter with uh, these uh, these quotes to the uh, to the library committee, and um, surprisingly for for Mr. Mr. Kennedy and others, the library committee relented uh, and uh, essentially accepted his assessment that uh, maybe we would we shouldn't throw out the whole uh, uh, the whole collection. Um, uh, uh, willy nilly, and that uh, that there's something here that's worth uh, that's worth saving, uh, and uh, that would uh, that would actually determine um, uh, the the path of the Athenaeum for the next uh, for the next half century or so. Uh, albeit uh, the the early uh, start on that path was was slow indeed. Uh, by the 1960s. Um, the uh, leadership of the Athenaeum uh, was uh, conducted under um, George uh, Vaux, who served as our president from 1966 to 1996. Uh, and beginning in the 50s and certainly continuing under Mr. Vaux, uh, he assembled um, board members, and, and I'm not gonna tell you all of the board members, but he assembled a number of board members who uh, uh, were experts in the field of history, uh, museums, uh, and libraries, uh, and uh, just quickly going through some of some of these folks. One was uh, Roy Franklin Mick Nichols, a history professor at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, a Pulitzer Prize-winning author uh, in 1949, who uh, won the, the Pulitzer for uh, his book um, uh, on uh, American democracy during the Civil War. Another was uh, Richard Howland, who was an architectural historian and um, uh, associated with the, uh, the Smithsonian uh, Institution. Uh, Walter Muir Whitehill uh, was asked to be on the board as well, and so that was a great, uh, a great um, a plus for us as well. And so he served on our board while he was also director of the, the Boston Athenaeum. Uh, and uh, Edwin Wolf II, uh, the, uh, the irascible and uh, famous uh, librarian of the library company, uh, who uh, himself was turning around a 200 year old institution uh, and breathing new life into it and expanding its, uh, uh, its collections and opening, uh, opening those historic collections up to, uh, to the general public. Uh, so you have this sort of a uh, fire um, um, uh, collective fire among uh, among the brain power, uh, expertise, and networking uh, of the of the board. Two people that I don't have uh, images for are Robert C. Robert C. Smith, who was uh, an art historian, a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, and Edgar P. Richardson, who uh, was uh, an art historian and the former director of the Detroit Institute of Arts. So there were some fairly heavy hitters uh, on, on the board uh, guiding um, with Mr. Vox uh, where the Athenaeum might go and, and how, it might, how it might get there. Uh, one, uh, one last person that I wanna mention on the board is Dr. George Tatum, uh, the, uh, who was an architectural historian and a professor of architecture uh, at the University of Delaware. Uh, Dr. Tatum wrote a, um, a marvelous book that I, that I still use all the time, uh, The um, uh, Penn Scrape Town uh, in 1961, which is a, uh, probably the best comprehensive history of uh, Philadelphia architecture uh, up to that point. Uh, and um, when uh, the Athenaeum needed a new director after uh, uh, Mr. Boone resigned in 1960, uh, 1968, uh, what Dr. Tatum did was recommend to uh, Mr. Vox, um, a young uh, a graduate student of his who was uh, working on his dissertation at the University of Delaware uh, on the uh, master builders of colonial Philadelphia, uh, a young man by the name of Roger W. Moss. Uh, and Roger came on board in 1968 uh, at the age of 28. Uh, and um, so there was uh, not only uh, expert uh, uh, blood at the top, but also uh, also young uh, young blood uh, at the top as well. So Roger began his career in 1968 at the Athenaeum. He's seen there uh, at the uh, at the Bonaparte desk. So one of the things that Roger uh, had to um, uh, had to deal with uh, when he arrived at the Athenaeum was what to do with all this space at the Athenaeum. And that might be a question that you would think is, is odd, uh, especially considering our, our troubles today. Uh, but um, the insurance company uh, that had been in the front uh, offices of the first floor uh, left uh, for Cherry Hill, New Jersey. 
Uh, and so that, uh, that space was vacant. And the Philadelphia Maritime Museum had, um, had moved uh, as well uh, to uh, new quarters on uh, Chestnut Street. They had been on the, the rear of the first floor of the, the Athenaeum building. Um, so there actually was a lot of primary public space uh, that was uh, available on our uh, on our first floor. the the rear uh, The rear room essentially became our reference room as our as our collections were growing, uh, and that was used uh, that was used for researchers uh, to come in. Um, so, in addition to uh, the issue of what do we do with the space. Uh, Three of the things uh, that uh, that Roger had to deal with were code compliance for the building. Uh, it, it, it literally was a dangerous uh, building. Uh, control and the conservation of, of collections. By control, I mean the, the cat, the professional cataloging, uh, and connections uh, with the world beyond Sixth Street. Uh, and uh, those three things sort of track uh, the next uh, the next forty years of uh, of a life uh, at the Athenaeum. This is what the front hall looked like uh, when, uh, when Roger arrived. Uh, thank goodness for Pauline there because uh, she, she provides a uh, uh, sort of a uh, geographical um, true north uh, in, in orienting yourself to, uh, to the, the spaces uh, pre-restoration. Pre one of the solutions that uh, that Roger came up with for uh, filling the space uh, uh, was, uh, was an innovative one and, and of course, he's doing this with the uh, approval of, of, of George Vox and the, uh, the rest of the board, uh, was uh, an association with the Victorian Society, which uh, by 1966 had spun off uh, an, American, uh, an American version of the organization uh, founded by uh, Henry Russell Hitchcock and then Nicholas Pez, uh, Pepster. When, um, when it was first founded, the main offices were in, uh, in New York City, um, but Roger uh, suggested uh, that um, the Athenaeum would be a, an ideal home for the Victorian Society, which was uh, becoming extremely active at the time in promoting uh, Victorian architecture, uh, uh, both, through, uh, both through tours, uh, lectures, uh, publications, uh, and um, would also be instrumental in, in developing collections, as we'll, we'll find out. It also provided um, uh, a tenant to pay rent, uh, which also helped the Athenaeum's um, uh, fragile uh, finances uh, from 1968 through, uh, through 2000. Uh, and uh, one of the first things that the Athenaeum and the Victorian Society worked on together, uh, the book on the left was the Cape May Handbook, uh, which was uh, published in, in the in the 1970s and was the first to uh, examine um, Cape May as uh, a reasonable uh, a reasonable uh, example of, of 19th century architecture. Uh, and um, there were a number of books that were were published uh, based on uh, Victorian uh, paint schemes as well. The first of which was uh, Century of Color, uh, which was a, a reprint of. Um, the F.W. DeVoe uh, a book um, based on a reprint of the F.W. DeVoe Paint Company trade catalog. And so the Victorian Society was instrumental, instrumental in, in uh, driving a lot of uh, collections and collection donations, particularly relative to 19th century studies uh, to the Athenaeum uh, during, uh, during the, uh, the, 19, uh, the 1970s. Also occurring in the 1970s, this is our, our, our backyard. And in 1972, the uh, University of Pencil, uh, Pennsylvania uh, sponsored an archeological dig uh, in our backyard. Um, our yard was the last undisturbed site from the Walnut Street Prison Workshop. And these are some of the young folks that were, uh, that were involved in that uh, in the summer of 1972. Um, interesting, uh, uh, interestingly enough, Aside from the rather large holes in the ground, you can see the uh, the old burglar alarm tape on the uh, on the windows. That was our security system at the time, and that uh, lovely uh, that lovely vase uh, right uh, right in the window too, uh, protected by that uh, that thin strip of uh, burglar tape. The uh, as you uh, may recall, the Athenaeum was built on the site of the Walnut Street Prison. Uh, in this drawing on the left hand side is the corner of Sixth and Walnut, shows the outline of the main prison building. 
Uh, our building was built over top of the, uh, the, the workhouse for the prison. And the area to the top of this uh, image shows our backyard uh, and the remnants of, uh, of the, uh, the uh, semi-hexagonal uh, semi building uh, there. And so that's what they were uncovering. There's the detail uh, of that. So the, this uh, survives underneath our building and underneath our garden. Uh, and some of the things that they uncovered, there were more than 1,500 artifacts that were uncovered in the dig, uh, all of which now uh, live uh, at the University Museum, and they were uh, published in a, um, uh, in a book um, uh, by Dr. John Cotter, who uh, oversaw, the, uh, oversaw the dig. Uh, one of the things they uncovered was a, a six-plated cast iron stove uh, from, the, uh, from the 18th century. Uh, and uh, there were also things that the, uh, the prisoners shouldn't have had, such as uh, dice and, and knives and other kinds of contraband that were, were collected. After the dig was done, and uh, the dig was in 1972, uh, by 1976, the, the garden had been restored. Uh, this is uh, uh, some of the members uh, on the uh, sort of the initiation of the garden. Uh, there was an organization called the Philadelphia Society of Little Gardens uh, who took responsibility for the care of uh, a couple of dozen gardens in the old city area. Uh, and they were responsible for the maintenance and the planting of, uh, of our garden each year. Uh, they also were responsible for the, for the um, uh, reproduction Victorian fountain uh, that, that used to be back there. Uh, in one of these uh, parties here, you see, if you look all the way behind the bearded man, there's Roger Moss standing behind the bar. Uh, the man with the beard, I believe, is, uh, uh, is um, uh, Mr. Childs, who was, the, uh, who was the curator at the time. Uh, the reason that they were able to go back to the garden uh, and that the building looked so much better than it had in the in the in 1972 is that between 1974 and 1976 there was a major and the first uh, renovation uh, and restoration of of the Athenaeum building uh, and this is a rear view uh, that shows uh, the primary pieces that uh, that were in that uh, construction project. Uh, one was the fire stair uh, tower uh, shown in the left foreground, uh, but most importantly, the new rare book vault underneath the entire, uh, the entire footprint of the Athenaeum. Uh, the, uh, uh, it included the excavation of the basement uh, level for uh, archival stacks, including climate controlled and uh, fire suppressed areas. Um, uh, in installation of a garden wall, a gate and fencing, uh, selected brownstone repair, reinstallation of the gas lamps uh, in the front of the building, the restoration of the second floor rooms, um, and the removal of the, uh, uh, the furnaces and the replacement uh, with a seam loop so there would be no combustible material in the building, and also a complete upgrade of the wiring, plumbing, and security systems. Uh, and it was just in time. Uh, when the uh, furnaces were removed in, in 1975, uh, it was seen that in the area above, the, in, above them in the basement that there had been severe charring uh, of, the, uh, of the beams. Uh, and um, the, uh, the engineers at the time who removed that said that there was no way uh, that, those, um, that those furnaces would have lasted another winter without causing a fire. Again, that's not something anybody likes to see uh, over top of their uh, over top of their furnace. Uh, so when the foundation was dug out, the, the original level uh, was a dirt floor, which came uh, at about the level of where that landing is. Uh, so about four feet had to be dug out, underpinned with concrete, uh, and there is one of the workmen uh, who is putting in the uh, putting in the railing to match the John Notman railing uh, that it's going to be attached to there. By 1977, the Athenaeum had been declared a National Historic Landmark. Uh, within Philadelphia County, there's more than 11,000 buildings on the National Register, but there were fewer than 70 that are National Historic Landmarks. So we immediately took our place uh, in the cream of the crop of, uh, of important architectural buildings. And uh, it finally looked like it, at least in our, in our public areas. And uh, in 1978, we made the cover of Antiques Magazine. It's always great to have a cover shot with the newly restored rooms. Uh, 
Uh, and one of the one of the great things about the Athenaeum is that uh, the uh, the original furniture and some some even earlier than uh, uh, than when this building opened in 1847 uh, were still intact uh, and and could be placed back into the members' reading room as well as into the uh, into the newspaper room beyond. By the end of the 1970s, we hosted two major architectural exhibitions. Uh, one uh, in 1978 uh, uh, was uh, curated by uh, Constant, the late Constance Greif, uh, who had written a comprehensive catalog of the uh, work of John Notman. Uh, and uh, the second one, the following year, was on Thomas Houston Walter, uh, curated by uh, uh, Robert Ennis of Drexel University, who had been working on Walter for, for many, many years. Uh, both of those exhibitions were loan exhibitions, uh, and um, but the, but they began to help identify the Athenaeum uh, uh, organization with uh, with the subject of architecture, and they were both very much uh, very much noted and uh, and, and praised. Um, and within uh, within uh, five years of uh, this first exhibition, uh, the Athenaeum would own the lion's share of uh, the not the John Notman collection. Uh, as well as all of the surviving uh, Thomas Houston Walter collection uh, that had been in the hands of his family. When you start collecting things, the other major uh, effort that was made in the, that was begun in the 1970s was the retroactive cataloging uh, of the collection. Uh, and here is Keith Kahn, who was our bibliographer from 19, uh, 1979. My caption is incorrect there. He began here in 1979. Uh, and worked here and, until he passed away in, in 1993. Uh, the, he is not in front of a computer. Uh, we had no computers then. That is an OCLC terminal. Uh, and so that, uh, that machine uh, enabled him to catalog and check other catalogs in about 20,000 uh, um, libraries worldwide. And uh, likewise, the material from our collection that he was entering was uh, suddenly also available to, to libraries worldwide. That may not seem like an important thing in today's world, but it was revolutionary uh, at the time and certainly revolutionary for the Athenaeum. And the basis of our, uh, of our uh, book collection and our cataloging today, the things that make it so easy for you as members to, uh, to, uh, to get books, not only at the Athenaeum but elsewhere, uh, is based in a great deal on, on Keith's work. And we very much appreciate it uh, and, and miss him as well. Uh, the uh, creation of the underground, uh, the underground vault uh, also allowed for the installation of uh, flat files as well as uh, bookshelves for the for the rare books, so that as our architectural collections grew uh, and they were growing, uh, we had some place to put them. One of the uh, uh, the things, that, the catalysts for the growth of the architectural collection was a uh, research project. Uh, that was begun by uh, Roger Moss and uh, Sandra Tatman, who had been the architectural librarian at the Athenaeum. Um, uh, it was an NEEH-sponsored uh, uh, grant to create a biographical dictionary of Philadelphia architects, uh, which provided a biography and project list for uh, more than a thousand architects and master builders between the years 1700 uh, and 1930. Um, the, um, you'll notice that uh, the, the vertical view of the book shows that it is very threadbare, uh, which is always high praise for a book. Uh, you don't want to, uh, it's, it's high praise for a book that it gets used a lot. One of our greatest, uh, uh, our greatest claims to fame was that this, uh, there were three copies of this book at the Van Pelt Library and all three had been stolen. So that was high, high praise indeed. But the research required for the biographical dictionary in, involved uh, contacting uh, hundreds of um, uh, successor firms and children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews for information on the biographies of, uh, of their fathers, uh, mothers, uncles, uh, cousins. Uh, and often when, uh, when we contacted um, uh, we contacted these folks, they'll say, oh, well, I never knew that anybody was uh, interested in granddad's things. We have drawings in the garage, attic, bunkhouse, uh, kitchen, uh, basement. Uh, would you like to have them? And, and so drawings came in by the sheet full uh, and by the truck full. Uh, and uh, so the, the drawing collection uh, grew enormously uh, in, uh, in that time, time period that the biographical dictionary uh, was created. 
Um, when that finished in, in 1983, uh, they hired a brash young man uh, who had been on the picket lines uh, in uh, 1982, um, uh, saving the, uh, the Lit Brothers building. I was hired uh, as, um, as a cataloger uh, uh, for a grant that was financed by the NHPRC, that's the National Historical um, uh, Publication and Records Commission, Division of the National Archives, to create a catalog of that, uh, of that architectural collection that was growing very, very quickly uh, at that time. And so um, here is the catalog, it's a two volume set, uh, and this is not a catalog in, in the sense of, uh, of what uh, Connie Greif had done for Notman, uh, but these are thousands of card catalog, uh, catalog cards uh, that were printed by G.K. Hall in a two, vol in a two volume set. That was the extent of the, the outreach in those days um, because there was no uh, format uh, to put those into the uh, library program that uh, Keith Cobb was using. Uh, OCLC um, suggested that people who had architectural drawings should use the same cataloging format as you would for flashcards and dolls. So uh, in the early 1980s, uh, architectural drawings were sort of looked at oddly, like what do we do with these in terms of cataloging? And they were, they were tough to store as well. And so what I did was I created an in-house catalog and then to get that information out, it was published in this two volume set and uh, was circulated in about 300 libraries. The Biographical Dictionary had a circulation, I think, of about a thousand in libraries across the, across the country. You remember catalog cards, uh, and uh, the uh, the collection uh, the collection grew, and so did uh, did the catalog. This is uh, Jill uh, Jill Lemin Lee. One of the one of the ways that I know that I've been here for a long time is that when I started working here. Uh, researchers would ask me to to direct them to the card catalog. As the years went by, they would say, I've never used one of these. Could you show me how it works? Uh, and now that they point and say, what is that cabinet over there? So uh, during uh, this, this chart shows the growth of our architectural drawing collection. This is not the books, uh, not the photographs, but just the drawings. Uh, and if you look between 1839 and 1973, we were very stable in terms of our architectural drawings. So those are the drawings for the, the competitions for this building, 39 sheets. Between 1973 and 1975, that had grown to 600 sheets. And that's primarily through the gift of uh, a Mrs. Walter Meller of the uh, Meller, Megs and Howe collection. Uh, so there, um, there were about 600 sheets in, in those two years. Uh, between 1976 and 1983, the, the time of the years of the, uh, the biographical dictionary, the, uh, the drawing collection had numbered uh, about 30,000. Uh, and that's when they decided to hire me because they needed to get control uh, of, that, uh, of that collection. I was hired on a two-year grant. And yes, I did, uh, I did complete it in the two years. Uh, but then we kept going, so to speak. So between 1983 and 1999, uh, the collection of draw just drawings grew sixfold. Uh, and uh, so it was an enormous uh, collection. And the more that, uh, the more that came in, the, the, more that, uh, uh, the more that people were contacting us about, uh, about taking things. So why architecture? Uh, that's a question that I'm, I'm asked a lot. Well, there is, there is a trace in our history, you know, in the, um, in the uh, 1870s, the Philadelphia chapter of the AIA had their first offices on our third floor uh, in what is now Mike Seneca and Denise Fox's uh, office. Uh, and in uh, 1870, they, uh, they sent out this circular letter to their membership calling for the establishment of uh, an architectural library and reading room uh, uh, in the third story of the Athenaeum building in this city and they were to call it the Architectural Library of Philadelphia. In thus making architecture a specialty, the collection will very soon be far more complete than any comprised in our larger libraries. And it will afford the student, as well as the amateur, facilities for reference, for study, that no miscellaneous library, either public or private, can be expected to furnish. You have to realize, you know, the, there was no public library yet uh, at, at this time. 
Um, the school at the University of Pennsylvania had not yet been founded. And so this seemed like an ideal library to have uh, to have a, a, a special place just for the, the study of architecture. And they solicited gifts of books and photographs and drawings from their own members. Well, that didn't get off the ground in the 1870s. The, uh, the um, AIA left, uh, left the Athenaeum in 1876 and went to a number of offices around town. But in 1984, uh, one of the first major collections that I accessioned uh, was the uh, the archives of the uh, architectural uh, of the uh, Philadelphia chapter of AIA, uh, and included in that were uh, about 60 uh, John Notman drawings, uh, and um, uh, as well as the draw the measure drawings that were done for the old Philadelphia survey and the Proto Habs uh, surveys in uh, in the 19 teens through the 1930s. Here's our staff in, uh, in 1990. It's a partial, partial staff view. Uh, from, from left to right, it's uh, Jeanette Kohler, who was our, our receptionist at the time. Uh, yours truly uh, in, in the glasses. Uh, Joe Pinella, who was our, uh, our custodian. Uh, Eileen McGee, who was the assistant director for programs. Uh, next to her is uh, Ellen Batty, uh, or Ellen, now Ellen Rose, uh, who was our circulation librarian. Uh, Emily Freeman, who was a cataloging assistant. Uh, and uh, Mrs. G, our, our membership uh, secretary. Um, not seen here are uh, Roger Moss and, um, and Keith Kahn. Uh, Keith hated having his picture taken and uh, we're really actually rather surprised that uh, we managed to, uh, to find that one of him in 1979. So he chose not to, to sit in with us. Uh, Roger must have been busy with some, uh, something else uh, that day. One thing I wanted to point out uh, uh, that during this time period, we had a remarkable stability in our uh, primary staff. Uh, so um, uh, uh, I've been with the Athenaeum for 38 years. Uh, Eileen uh, was with the Athenaeum for 41. Uh, Ellen was with us for uh, close to 30. Uh, and then Mrs. G was with us for more than 50 uh, and then still comes back to us uh, on an as needed basis. Uh, so that provided a remarkable stability in the uh, in the organization uh, itself, uh, and in no way is uh, is a small part of the the success uh, of our institution. Uh, so it's a good thing that we all got along uh, in 1990 because uh, in 1991 there was a major renovation that required the entire staff to vacate the first floor of the building, uh, and uh, the entire staff of the Athenaeum shared the newsroom, what is now the Bush room, uh, for the better part of a year. Uh, structural engineers had indicated that the, uh, uh, the, uh, the structure of the building was not sufficient to hold up both the first and the second floor. And so steel was uh, uh, inserted into the building, which required uh, the, the vacating of the, um, uh, of the first floor while that major work was done. Uh, but it allowed us to create the gallery on the first floor and to uh, reconfigure the first floor front office, uh, also to create an office suite uh, on the first floor in the rear where our, our boardroom is and where the imaging center is now. It also allowed for the creation of a book stack in the Bush Room in 1991. And so the building looked better than it had ever. <laughs> uh, and so some of the first floor renovations uh, here in the back you'll be familiar with, the Grand Stair. These are photographs by Tom Crane uh, the, uh, the, Bush, uh, the Bush reading room. And uh, there's a survey of uh, some of our arch archival collections and how they, uh, how they break down. And they grew, uh, and they certainly grew out of the building very, very quickly. We were fortunate. Um, we, uh, we rented space for a brief time from the Baltz Institute for e Ethnic Studies, uh, then from uh, philosophical, uh, the Philosophical Society in Franklin Hall. Uh, but then for many years, we were in uh, the Penn Mutual building uh, and that provided a, a handy overflow uh, as our collections grew. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a, one of our storage methods for architectural drawings uh, in, in roles. Photographs came in as well, uh, and uh, including uh, those for the, uh, the, the Boyd Theater through the, through, through the Glazer collection. Um, but uh, old buildings uh, have a way of, of uh, continuing to present uh, challenges. And in 1994, uh, they discovered this broken roof beam. 
Uh, and so uh, a steel structure had to go in to reinforce the roof and then the roof had to be re replaced as well. So uh, one of the lessons is that, uh, that old buildings uh, uh, continue to need care and they are, they, are never, uh, they are never done. So if we look at the rebirth of the Athenaeum between, in this time period, the building is restored, it's expanded, the collections are cataloged and refined and expanded. Repeat, uh, among the major collections that we acquired at the time is the uh, 500 plus drawings of Thomas Eustick Walter, which we acquired from his, uh, from his family. Uh, the 17,000 drawing uh, Paul Philippe Cray collection, which uh, came in in 1990, uh, including these drawings for the Rodin Museum. And uh, we also participated in a program sponsored by the Pew Charitable Trusts uh, in 1989 through 91, uh, where, um, where architectural and uh, geographic collections were transferred to the Athenaeum uh, and uh, the um, Pew paid for the cataloging as well as the conservation. And as part of that, we acquired the, uh, the architectural drawings and maps from the Radnor Historical Society. And this is a map of the Pelham neighborhood in Philadelphia designed by Wendell and Smith from about 1907. Also in the collection are uh, uh, rare books, uh, both of American as well as uh, British, and French, and uh, other European countries. Um, the Stuart Rivette's uh, Antiquities of Athens. We have several, uh, several uh, copies of this, including uh, a copy that has uh, a W. Strickland book plate in it, which we're, we're happy to attribute to William Strickland. Samuel Sloan's Model Architect. Uh, the Athenaeum has an incredible collection of uh, house, house pattern books uh, beginning, uh, beginning in the early uh, 19th century, uh, right up through the Sears catalogs in, uh, in the 20th. We also have a cre uh, the creation of the exhibition uh, space, the uh, Haas Gallery, uh, gave us an opportunity to show off our uh, rare materials uh, on a, a regular basis. Uh, this is uh, actually an exhibition um, of, the, uh, of the collection of Dr. Eliza Booker, uh, who uh, gave us uh, uh, gave us a wonderful collection of maps and prints from the the, uh, the 19th century, uh, and we did. Uh, uh, we did a, uh, an exhibition. Uh, Mr. Zabooker is the man, uh, the, the shorter man in the bow tie there, uh, in the uh, uh, on the left hand side of the picture. Uh, he was uh, he was 99 when that exhibition uh, when that exhibition opened, uh, and uh, he passed uh, about five years later, uh, but uh, was a great uh, great benefactor of, of the Athenaeum, uh, both with uh, uh, both with his. Uh, 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 expertise as well as his, his kind generosity. There's a, a, a sampling of some of the exhibitions that we've had over the years. And some more. The, uh, the, the dark blue one at the bottom there, Architecture Exposed, was an ex the, the first exhibition that was held in the Haas Gallery. And uh, that was uh, to highlight uh, some of those things that came to the Athenaeum through the Pew Museum Loan Program. So, so we have here, um, uh, how, how, did, how did we get so far in, in, in so short a, a time? Um, well, uh, one was through partnerships, uh, one through the Victorian Society in America. And while the institutions uh, uh, did not have the same corporate purpose, they certainly had congruent corporate purposes uh, and they worked together uh, for 30 years uh, in, in building each other up. Uh, the Athenaeum was a founding member of the Philadelphia Area Consortium of Special Collections Libraries, PACSCL, uh, which actually was a creation of, uh, of Edwin Wolf. Um, uh, he, he did an exhibition called Legacies of Genius uh, in the mid 1980s, uh, where he uh, borrowed material from, uh, from about uh, a dozen uh, special collections libraries in Philadelphia. And that exhibition and the catalog for it became the kernel of uh, PACSCL which is a, a wonderful organization uh, in terms of um, um, professional development and, uh, and um, uh, fundraising as well. The Athenaeum was a founding member of the International Confederation of Architectural Museums, ICAM, in 1979. And we have a partnership with the Historic American Building Survey. Uh, we maintain the uh, Charles E. Peterson Prize Fund 
uh, for the best set of uh, student drawings submitted to AJBS. Over the years, we've also had foundation support. Uh, all that cataloging, uh, both of the uh, both of the book collection uh, and later of the uh, of the architectural collection, uh, once a, a format had been developed, uh, was through the Pew Charitable Trusts, uh, William Penn Foundation, Barra Foundation, the uh, National Endowments, uh, the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission, and the Gladys Brooks Foundation, which provided uh, endowment support from for my own position. So I had to had to mention them. Uh, and then we cannot forget that the, the generous and continuous support of, uh, of the members of the Athenaeum over this time with uh, uh, dozens of named book funds uh, and named conservation funds and named symposia funds and named fellowship funds. Uh, and the, Athenaeum, uh, the Athenaeum shareholders have been uh, incredibly generous uh, uh, through the years and none of this would have been possible without, without their support. So we have uh, the rebirth of the Athenaeum uh, in between 1968 and 1999. And it's the first time I've ever actually considered it, um, that in one generation, uh, our membership quadrupled. Uh, there was incredible uh, in, a growth of the endowment, which was, uh, which was in, in very, very sad shape uh, in 1968. Uh, the building was expanded uh, and the collection was expanded and made accessible through um, state of the art uh, electronic um, capabilities at the time. And then our program was expanded in terms of, uh, in terms of our lectures. Uh, and all of this happened in, in just, uh, just a single generation through the support of, of those folks uh, that I had mentioned before, particularly our membership. One person that I do want to point out uh, particularly is Charles E. Peterson, uh, FAIA. Uh, Peterson uh, had been a, a, a member of the Athenaeum since 1951 uh, when he became the historical architect for Independence National uh, Historical Park. Uh, and um, this photograph was taken of him in uh, at Independence Hall in 1996. Uh, last week, the Carpenters Company uh, had, a, had a viewing of uh, uh, an oral history video uh, that had done, been done the same year as this, uh, this photograph. Uh, and he said that uh, he struck his, uh, his best uh, George Washington chin uh, pose there. Uh, but Mr. Peterson was extraordinarily generous to the Athenaeum. The two houses that he lived in on Spruce Street, uh, he gave to the Athenaeum and the income from those, uh, those houses became the, uh, the foundation of the Charles E. Peterson Fellowship, uh, which is now in its 32nd year uh, and uh, the Peterson, uh, the Peterson jury is actually meeting uh, meeting this Friday, and that uh, um, supports uh, a scholarship in uh, in early American building technology uh, and and architecture. Now, as the uh, 1990s uh, um, uh, came about, uh, Mr. Vox passed away in 1996, and his uh, his leadership role at the Athenaeum uh, was assumed by uh, Lee Carson Shirk. Uh, who herself has been uh, a tremendous leader and supporter of the Athenaeum's uh, collections and, and staff, uh, and ably uh, led us towards the uh, towards the 20, 21st century. So, some of you uh, may be old enough to remember the uh, the Y2K square, uh, but um, the Athenaeum was actually not scared uh, of the arrival of, of, of the uh, the 21st uh, century. Um, because for the previous 30 years, we had built, been building layer upon layer of institutional capacity, not just, uh, not just of an electronic version, uh, but, uh, but also of a programmatic uh, and, and staff, uh, staff expertise version. Uh, you have here the, um, uh, a reproduction of our first, uh, of our first web page, which was uh, sponsored through, uh, through LibertyNet. Uh, some of you may recall uh, LibertyNet. Uh, and so uh, we did not have to fear um, the, uh, the, the arrival of the 21st, 21st century uh, at all. So thank you very much. The next time uh, we talk about uh, the Athenaeum, I will be talking a little bit about the 219 in the 21st century and, uh, and uh, the Athenaeum's embrace of the digital age. Thank you so much. Right, thank you, Bruce. And looks like there are questions coming. 
We just have a little bit of time. So let's see where we will we'll go. The first question is from Stephen, uh, wondering why are the things found in 1972 by Penn in the University Museum since its focus is not on Philadelphia, but ancient history? That would be through Dr. John Cotter. Uh, and uh, he, he was the person that, that led that. And I, I'm not exactly sure uh, why, but uh, I get, uh, if I got a copy of the, uh, of the report that he wrote, I could, I could let you know. Great. And Tim says, in PAB, I've seen plans, surveys for the building from the 1950s and 1960s that call the rear first floor a, quote, reading room. Did it ever actually serve that purpose? And relatedly, some later plans mentioned an annex on the back of the building that was clearly never built. <laughs> what happened to that project? Well, uh, whoever you are, thank you very much for looking at PAB. And isn't it wonderful that you can find out those, uh, those secrets? The, uh, yes, the Athenaeum did have a reading room on, on the, uh, the rear of the first floor. Everything behind the, um, uh, behind the door where our ladies' room is at the cross hall, that had been one large room. Uh, and uh, it had been the home of the Maritime Museum. But when I, when I started working at the Athenaeum in 1983, that was our reference room. And so there were book stacks in there. And when people come in, came in to do research, uh, that, that's where they did it. Uh, and so uh, there was a, there was a, a plan uh, early on to, uh, I shouldn't say early, uh, in the mid 1980s to build a, an additional um, uh, vault space uh, underneath our garden with a pavilion uh, uh, space on top. Uh, perhaps with a perhaps with a glass floor. Uh, one of the problems with that, however, uh, there was some investigation for that done. Uh, one of the problems with that is that um, uh, we found uh, Delaware River water uh, about two feet higher than uh, than we needed to go. Uh, so that would have been extremely problematic, particularly for uh, collection storage. Uh, so yeah, uh, one of the great things about studying in architecture is, is studying the unbuilt things. And there's, there's plenty of things unbuilt with the Athenaeum uh, alone. But yes, that, that was our reference room. So Mark, I think I can answer this question quickly. So he's wondering about the fate of the, the, the Dilworth house um, and if we had an interest in acquiring the property. Is actually, Turchie just sold it to another um, and, and property investment uh, uh, company, which is in the process of uh, not 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 to make any changes in the exterior envelope of Turchie's plan, but the interior of the building. And for the timeline, they hope to start breaking ground in June. Um, against that's their goal. So, no. <laughs> Um, I, I think there have been opportunities in the past when the board has had opportunities to, to look at the Dilworth property and has chosen not to, and there are those who wish that they had made another choice. Um, but hopefully we will have some good neighbors and new members of the Athenaeum when that project is finished and folks are living there. That's a great question. Um, Lonnie says, great so much. I'm gonna check over in the chat. I think there were a couple. Lois, thanks for the photo of Keith. And from the OCLC terminal. Um, so, oh, Carol says, Dr. Z Booker, the dentist, died at age 105. Really nice, really sharp bibliophile and an inveterate walker. Um, Adam has a question wondering what role the Arctic plays in the Athenaeum. The other about does it might make money or only break, break even is is a complicated accounting question depending on how you figure things out um, whether it makes money or breaks breaks even. But uh, Bruce, you want to talk about the role it plays in the Athenaeum? Arctic. Yes. With, uh, the, okay. Uh, well, in terms of uh, in terms of, uh, of making PAB or or, or geo history. Uh, or the uh, now the builder's guide site possible it, it, it wouldn't be without uh, without uh, the Arctic uh, so um, uh, it, it does play a, a, a vital role uh, that way uh, and uh, if it's the atom that I'm thinking of uh, you you know that better than anybody <laughs> <laughs> and, and th question, thanks for the plug. <laughs> <laughs> I would say with with uh, with any part of an institution, there there are often multiple reasons beyond whether it makes money or breaks even or whatever why you why you uh, you have certain services. Um, so, all right, well, Tess is is curious here. Why? Uh, where were the exhibitions before the current gallery? Uh, well. Uh, at the bottom of the grand stair opposite Pauline, 
1976, there had been three enormous wall-mounted cases uh, that, uh, that, were, uh, that were there. The, the door to what's now the member's lounge was not there. That, 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 that lounge was access, or that room was accessed through the cross hall and then, this, then the Bonaparte parlor. So there was a solid wall there um, um, uh, at the bottom of the grand stair. So there were three large uh, cases in there uh, so that small exhibitions could be done in there. Uh, there were some, uh, there were some freestanding cases uh, that could be used on the second floor. But when, uh, when the uh, Notman and the, um, and the Walter exhibitions took place uh, in 1978 and 79, there were custom made uh, freestanding cases that were, were quite large uh, uh, installed in the, in the newsroom, uh, the, the west room of the second, uh, second floor. Uh, and uh, eventually those got, got scavenged and used in various places in the building and then, uh, and then uh, you know, completely dismantled and, uh, and, uh, and disposed of, particularly when the new gallery uh, was, was open. So, uh, so a lot of different places. And Carolyn, you just asked a question which will be answered in the next, uh, the next, the next issue, version, volume, uh, what is the episode? The next episode of, of uh, 219's history, 219 in the 21st century, which gives you a little clue about when um, the Philadelphia Architects and Buildings Database got started um, and which institutions contribute to it. Um, Bruce, do we have a date or Tess, do we have a date for the next next episode? I, I, I do not, but, but uh, please stand by. <laughs> you stand by. I, I know. Up. I know that we're, we're we are uh, already scheduled to hear uh, hear. I think from Mike Seneca uh, about the uh, uh, about the Builders Guide project, uh, and so that's uh, that's a portion of that. And uh, and so sometime, it'll probably be on a Tuesday at noon. We can. <laughs> and um, I hope folks will join us if you care about design and building for. Uh, Professor Tony Griffin from design, talking about design in the just city from the design in the just city program in uh, I was at Columbia in, in New York City. Uh, that will be uh, tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. Athenaeum members are free and general admission is five. You can find that on our events page and register. I hope you will join. There are still spaces for that virtual event, which should prove really uh, interesting with all the conversations that are going on in, in Philadelphia about how we create a more just and equitable city. Uh, Tess, in fact, just put the link on chat. So if you want to click on that and register, we look forward to seeing all of you. Our building is open. If you have research to do, contact Bruce. If you want to come check out a book, we're here. Just want to come say hi. We'd love to see you. Otherwise, we look forward to also seeing you safely on our virtual programs. Have a